Welcome to Q&A Selling Online with answers to questions about creating an online empire, promoting products, or building a brand. Your host, private label and e-commerce entrepreneur, Quinn Amorm. Welcome to the show, my friends. Today we have here with us sweethearts, best friends. They are a husband and wife team that build Half a Bubble Out, a marketing and a consulting firm. They're also the founders of HABO Village. That's an eight-year-old membership website that helps leaders build passions and provision companies full of profit, purpose, and legacy. For more than 17 years, they've helped business leaders across the entire world grow their companies. They both taught at universities, and they're also frequently uh, invited to speak at events. We have with us Michael and Catherine Redmond. How's it going, guys? Hello it's there. Well. Uh, thanks for having us today. It's really good to be here. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure having you guys here. So we're going to start by asking a few questions uh, before we get into business about you guys. Like, how did you meet and when did you meet? <laughs> wow. And you said everything. <laughs> uh, you want to start or you want me to start? So I would say the first time that Michael and I met, I was in sixth grade and he was in fourth grade and we were in a play <laughs> called The Hobbit. Good old Tolkien film, Our right? elementary yeah. school did what we call operettas, <laughs> and that was the school play that year, and we were in it together. Yes, and Michael had more lines than I did, even though he was two years younger. So that says something from the get-go about how many <laughs> words we've been allocated in life. <laughs> 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 so then we were, like, we knew each other. He was two years behind me, so as you can imagine, you know, when you're a, a senior in high school, you don't really care about the sophomores. Especially when um, you're a senior girl, you senior don't girl. care about these sophomore boys. Mm. Right. But yeah. we had become friends through a mutual friend over time. And, um, you know, who eventually was... became our best man at our wedding. Yeah. And we just kind of grew from uh, knowing each other, who each other was, to actually in high school and early college not liking each other at all. Yeah. With like with some intention. Yeah. So we kind of hated each other. We had a mutual best friend. And I thought that Michael was a really bad influence on our friend. And he thought that I was a self righteous, well, you can fill in the blank. <laughs> so <laughs> we actually had that conversation over blueberry pie in our friend's kitchen. So it wasn't pleasant, but we, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so needless to say, it had quite a long front end to the story. And then we ended up becoming, uh, more civil and then we became friends. And then we actually were at a wedding. We hadn't seen each other in about a year and we were at a wedding, uh, that we both knew the bride and groom and, fell in love like yeah. it was like love at first sight with someone you've known for a really long who time who you would have never ever ever dated at all talk about striking terror in your heart you're like i went to bed that night going it's it's michael michael kevin redmond like what is wrong with me what what ha, what is why am i attracted like no i mean i was terrified and that was 29 <laughs> years ago and so then we've been happily married for 20 27 years 28 years 28 28 years yeah We'll probably have a debate about that in a bit. Yeah, something. We've been married a long time. Long time. And it's doing business a long time. Years. So there you go. That's how, we, I mean, it's like, oh, there's a question for you. How did you meet? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's so fantastic. That is like, it's like a movie. As you guys were, were were talking about it, I almost forgot I was hosting a podcast. I'm like, <laughs> I'm, I'm here. I'm listening to this cool story. And uh, wow, and you're funny as well. So... <laughs> Well, if you ever want to have us on again, we'll extra we'll take that story and draw it out because it's an hour long story oh, alone gosh. with lots of punchlines in the middle of it, it all. It is so. quite a story. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay, go ahead. Next. <laughs> <laughs> so now uh, I know you guys work together. Now, if you were to look back into the past and know knowing what you know now, you still think working together would be a good idea? Hundred percent. Yes. Yeah, yep. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah no we doubt. love it. We absolutely love it. It gets it like yeah. just like our marriage. It gets better and better as yeah. time goes on. Yeah, we it wouldn't really have has. wouldn't have it any other way. And I know that sounds uh, that might sound trite or coy, but um, but it really is true for us. I mean, we we've, we've worked hard at it. it doesn't come easy. We've invested <laughs> time and energy and and lots of different things to continue to grow and deepen ourselves and each other and our relationship. But it really has gotten better over time. And so yeah. if, knowing what we know now, it's like, oh yeah, don't even think twice about Absolutely. it. Jump into it. Do it, and it get sooner it. maybe. Because we had had a period where um, after we got married, we worked at separate jobs and then we um, went into, Michael went into a career and I, I ended up working with him in that for about 
two years, yeah. two and a half uh, years. About, yeah. And then he needed to go back to school. So he went back to school. I went um, and worked at a software company and sold software nationally. And we got him through school. But when we started, when he started Half a Bubble Out, it was always, we really need to be working together again because that was a really good season. And um, we have really complementary gifts and skill sets. And so it's a lot of fun to work together. So. We're a great Venn diagram. <laughs> <laughs> so it looks like you guys have, have the secret sauce. Maybe that's something you, you can start a another consulting business, how to get couples to stay, to be best friends, that's one, and then stay in love. That's... Yeah. Uh, I mean, well, and even as we uh, wrote our book, I mean, we so we recently published this this book called Fulfilled, which is you alluded to it in the title, but it's the passion and provision strategy for building a business with profit, mm -hmm. purpose, and legacy. And part of the drive of that was how do you build a business while maintaining and strengthening relationships? So, so the business. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was just I just got an email from a friend yesterday who's like, "Could you help me? I'm super concerned about my son's marriage because he's married to his business." And, and he's, he's making money hand over fist, but they're living totally separate lives. And it's, it's not that they work together, but that's kind of a common story where people choose between making money and chasing career, but leave kind of this destructive wake, like they lose their marriage and their family and their kids don't talk to them and they don't go to the soccer games and all of those yucky things that, that end up um, kind of making for a pretty lonely life later. Yeah. Well, and we, and Early on, we were insistent on a couple of different things. You know, I mean, we were we were a lot younger then, uh, but we were we came up in a belief that a we work well together. The second one, or B, was that it is possible to have a business that's successful and growing and thriving. So it allows you that financial freedom and the time freedom at some level in your life. Um, I'm not. A, I don't really believe. Kind of disclaimer. I don't believe in passive income. Really, I think mm -hmm. there are everything out there requires work. I think that's a good thing as long as it aligns with who you are and you have a good attitude and everything else. But that work shouldn't take away from the rest of your life. Like you, you've got three kids. It shouldn't rob you from being a good parent, but you're still going to have to work hard and show them a good work ethic. A friend of ours sold a company um, uh, about 15 years ago for in the Internet space for right around 50 million dollars. So this was in the, this was like 2003, 2004. Wow. And he had a, he couldn't go into that space for five years because of a no compete. And as soon as the no compete was over, even before the no compete, he started doing things and building a couple of businesses. And then after it, he went full, full bore. And I said, what, why, why are you doing this? You have $50 million. You're in your early forties. <laughs> you don't have to work. You live in a, I mean, he, he lives in this little tiny town south of, Vancouver, Canada in America, right? He's in Washington state, but he's out in the middle of nowhere. It's not exactly like it's expensive to live there. Um, and he goes, I have four kids and I, A, I love to employ people and B, I want my kids to see a work ethic. I want them to know that you have to work in life and that's a good thing. And at the same time, family is important. So we went about going, okay, how do you do this? Cause we hadn't seen this worked out really well. And we started just figuring out how do you do a good business, make sure that you have a relationship at home. Our daughter is 24 now, and we have a fantastic relationship with her. All growing up, she said she'd never come work for the company. And then when she graduated from college, she said, I really like the company and I'd like to come back home to Chico. Can I work for the company? So we have a strong relationship with our daughter. We have a strong relationship here. We have a great peer group of people that we invest in and serve and, and serve in our community. And we started out going, it's a theory that we could do it and keep it all whole. And then we just figured out how to do it. We hired consultants and we sought mentors and we figured out how to find that joy in growing a company and so that it wouldn't sacrifice anything else. And then we developed friends and mentors of other companies that we found that were doing it too. So we had kind of like people we could watch and see that were 10, 15, 20 years older than us. And, um, it was fantastic. A friend of ours right recently, they've been married just over 40 years and have been in business together most of that time. She was the CFO of their company and she recently passed away. And uh, it was a it, very sad. It was a, a freak accident. I mean, she was they were out riding their bikes and it just kind of everything conspired and, and a car hit her. So she went suddenly and that was really hard for obviously for their family, for, for us as a community. 
But when I think about, you know, Stephen Covey, do you, you, you know who Stephen yeah. Covey was, right? <clears throat> yes. Seven Habits. One of the things I remember reading 20 years ago when I read it was, remember the, think about the end first. Keep the end in mind, right? Yes. That idea of what do you want to do? And, and he said in that book, think about what you want to be said at your funeral. And most of us don't think about that, but I've thought about that and we've talked about it periodically. It's like, what do I want said? And now that we're at this place where our friends lived a wonderful marriage for 40 years and raised three kids and have grandkids. And he says, I mean, they have really had a great marriage and he talks about the love of his life. But now you're at the end and you're saying, okay, what's being said about you? And they, they had employees that loved them in their company and they had a great marriage and they had all this. And I'm like, there's too many people out there who don't know this kind of stuff is possible. How do you build a healthy company that gives you the money, gives you the purpose, gives you the freedom, and at the same time is complementary to the rest of your life, not in, con- not in contrast to it? Because we would call that fulfilled. So we may have run on way too much for you, and you haven't. A- and so forgive me of just talking. No, no, no. no. It's, it's a pleasure listening to you. So I have a question about the name of the business. You named it Half a Bubble Out. So why does it have a special meaning? What does it mean? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. So do you, the, the actual physical reference is if you're, you know, hanging a picture or you're, you know, and you put the level on top of the picture and it's just yeah. slightly tilted, it's a half a bubble out. So that's the, so we tell people who aren't our friends that it's just another way to say, you know, we're creative. We look at the world a little differently, kind of on an angle. So, and that that is all true. But the origin of the name actually comes from, um, when we were in the middle of transitioning from that season where we were working together and needing to put Michael back in school, um, I was having a conversation with a mentor of ours and he had mentored both of us. And um, I said to him, Bob, we're thinking about putting Michael back in school because he, he hadn't finished his undergraduate degree and um, had kind of come into this career through the back door. And that, that was great, but he was getting a little bit of flack from people saying you really needed some of the higher ups were like i will they wouldn't say it directly but basically you'll get more respect if you have the college degree under your Mm -hmm. belt yeah so um so i asked bob what do you think of that and he said well kath your husband is a half a bubble out so if you want him to have the respect that he clearly deserves because he's really really smart he probably should just get the degree out of the way and he's basically saying your husband looks at the world a little different than the rest of us so he's a bit odd but the guy (laughs) loved me so i know he didn't mean anything horrible Mm -hmm. about it so i just we just laughed and laughed about that so then um put him back in school and now we're you know three years later and looking at starting this company and i was like i think we have to call it half a bubble out I just think we do. It's horrible to say. It's terrible to answer the phone. We get laughed at, but mm. nobody ever forgets it. And, you know, and ultimately it really does describe how we do life. Like it's, yeah. So it's, it ends up being a good description of who we are. <laughs> okay. I got it. <laughs> and then there you go. We don't look at the world the same way. It's a little off. Or a little off. Yeah. <laughs> isn't, like- that, isn't that true? Everybody looks yeah. at it with a different set of eyes. It's very true. Yes. Yeah, a different perspective. I uh, I worked in the oil sands many years ago, and yeah. there was um, basically it's when you extract oil from the sand instead of having to dig deep. And there was one of the CEOs there that once asked a bunch of employees to walk through a field, and then when they came back, he asked everybody what they saw, and everybody had seen different things. Mm. So the guy that was raised, it all depended on who you were as a person or who, how you were raised. Because the only one that saw cattle was the guy that was raised in a farm. Because mm. he w- that's what caught his attention, right? Yeah. All yeah. the others lo- saw the bulldozers, the excavators, you know, different things. And it was incredible that by the time they mentioned it, like, what, what do you mean cattle? This is like an oil field. But there was. And... uh <laughs> so everybody sees different things. You're absolutely right. Yeah. And it's really one of the tricky things about growing a business. I mean, most entrepreneurs look at the world a little differently. They feel a little, I mean, most entrepreneurs I've talked to say, you know, when you ask the question, do you feel like you're part of the normal pack? It's like, no, I, <laughs> that's why I started a business. I don't fit into the, I'm not like cattle. I must yeah. not go into the pen <laughs> and I must roam free over the tundra. Okay. So anyway, they, they do think about it. They look at the world. They've, they've had people 
tell them like, could you be more normal? And it's like, no, I can't be more normal. But it's amazing how many, how often when we're running our own business, like we work with entrepreneurs and business leaders all the time and how often they struggle be, of understanding the nuances of their business and taking it to the next level because they're in it all day and it's hard for them to now see fresh. And so that's when they show up here, it's like, well, let's, you get to find a mentor or a consultant that helps you uh, read the label from the outside of the bottle and give you perspective. And we all need that kind of help. Beautiful. And you just, you talked about uh, the book that you launched recently. It was a hardcover, a red hardcover book named Fulfilled. So I really like the cover of it with the full, oh, ga the full gas tank that's, uh, it, it's rememberable, if that is even a word. I like so, it. <laughs> rememberable. That's good. Rememberable. <laughs> so um, why did you decide to write it? Why did we decide to write the book, Catherine? So yeah, that's a really, really great question. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just say 400% is the answer to that question. 400% mm -hmm. so, is um, the amount that our company grew in the period of 18 months back in 2008, 2009, which was actually during the Great Recession. And we we had this season where we'd found this niche and it just took off and we were growing like gangbusters across the country, um, overseas. It was, it was an amazing time. It was the kind of thing that you think as an entrepreneur, this is the dream, the money is flowing, all the hard work's paying off, the cash is coming, things are great. And we, um, we were working super, super hard. But during that season, we hit this place where we, we really didn't like our company anymore. We didn't, we had made some, um, some hiring decisions really, really quickly to try and keep up and they weren't a great fit for who we are and we weren't a great fit for who they were. Mm. We had let clients in the door that were not ideal clients that were, um, not respectful at all of life and space and would call you on Saturday at two o'clock in the afternoon because they were grumpy and they wanted mm. something fixed and they assumed that you could do it and ought to on the weekend. Never mind if you were at Costco. Um, so all those things were happening and we hit this place where it was like, okay, the cash is rolling in and we are freaking miserable. Like driving to the door in the parking lot on a Monday morning and going, I do not want to cross the threshold of my own business. Mm. Okay. So that's the starting place of when we were like, okay, we have got to do something different. We either need to shut this sucker down and do something different or we have got to fix it because we cannot we cannot run our lives like this. This is not fulfilling. <laughs> this is painful. This is uncomfortable. There's tension. Our culture's yucky. So the only thing working is the cash. And as it turns out, that is not enough. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. not good. Provision matters, but it is not enough. So, um, so I'll transition and let you keep moving forward on what we started to do about that. Well, we came out of that. And, you know, earlier I was saying, you know, we continued to grow to figure out how to do this, how to make this thing work and be happy at it. And uh, this is really an important part of the story because it says we didn't do it perfectly and we didn't have just this upward trajectory. Mm -hmm. We had this moment, we had moments, this was just one of the big ones where it was really difficult and we had made some mistakes. And so when we started again, seeking counsel, finding our mentors or going back to some of our mentors and, and going back to the drawing board and going, what did we do wrong? How do we fix this? How do we tweak it? Even some of our solutions that helped improve it, we were learning and, you know, we were failing fast. We were. <laughs> we were failing really fast because we were making mistakes on trying to get out of it even, but we were making smaller and smaller mistakes. And so we ended up identifying three characteristics that were really important for businesses that we take companies through now, but we realized were important for us. We didn't, the first one was we didn't have a clear vision that about, that allowed us to talk about what we thought about the future, what our purpose was for now and what our core values were. Yeah. It's kind of that, the, the vision that kind of makes you go, why are we doing this? Because when the really, really hard times hit, mm -hmm. if you don't know why you're doing it, there's nothing to pull you forward. Yeah. It's there's awful. nothing to encourage yeah. you to persevere through the hard times. Right. And so many people, you know, the business failure rate is one of those big monsters out there that we're, that we're trying to fight against. And the, I mean, and we were on the verge of it. We were like, we could be one of those shops right now that, that just closes the door. Cause we're just sick of it. Yeah. We're sick of fighting the battle. 
So vision was, was one key piece of that. How do, we, how do we determine and really codify our values, what matters to us as we're running this company, and where we see this going, and why the world would change if we got there? And we turned to Jim Collins and looked at Good to Great, his book, yeah. and really took it and internalized it and, and made it our own of that concept of companies that are great companies, not just good companies, have this kind of vision that, that brings clarity, direction, and motivation. So when you have those things in your vision, so that was the first thing is the vision. Second thing was we needed a business model. We absolutely needed some kind of a business context. And, and we had it intuitively. I think most entrepreneurs do. You watch, you learn, you know, you know how to make the, you, you got a checkbook or you have an account, you know, you have Quicken books. You, <laughs> yeah. is money is, is the number at the bottom positive or negative. Okay. We're doing fine. It's positive. It's negative. Oh no, we're bad. And, and what, what's this thing? How do we know where our checklist is of a holistic perspective? And one of the things we realized is a lot of the solutions out there as you look around are do this one thing and it will fix your business. But right. they're not thinking about how it impacts anything else in your business or what if something else is sucking the life out of your business. You could, have a, you could be putting water in, in a sense, money in at a certain rate and have a hole that's just the same size, if not bigger, somewhere yeah. else. And they're like, that's not going to help. So we... We started looking, finding, pulling together business models, and we settled on a six-point business model that started with vision and it had five more points that went with it and allowed us to have a holistic perspective. Those were vision, leadership, management, marketing and sales, finance, and then culture. And when we realized we put those all together and put them on a graphic for us and we started looking at it and then thinking about how do we develop a plan that makes sure that we're as leaders just regularly walk around and going, hey, are we doing these things? Are we... Are we minding the shop, if, you know, an old metaphor, are we minding the shop well in all of these areas? And if we're neglecting them as a leader, including our own leadership style and our own leadership development, then we need to get in and, and work on that and tune it up and make sure because it, when we graph it out, it starts to look like a wheel and either the wheel's not round and it's got all these weird dents in it uh, <laughs> because you're not scoring well on these things or you, maybe you're doing really well, but you're not, you're not. You're, everything's equal, but it's not great. So you're not going to get very far, very fast. And so we kind of developed that. And that second point was just that you big companies, great companies, and our company need a business model that we can make sure that we're covering everything that gives us a holistic look at the entire company. And which, part of that is because so many, I mean, we do consulting, right? So we're working with all of these leaders and they come to us with, we mm. have this problem and we need a solution for this problem. Yeah. And, and because we were running a marketing agency, most of the time it's, I need more customers. So great, great you do. Um, you know, or I need a website, whatever it is. I need this one thing. And I'm just certain that if we just fix this one thing, that it'll fix everything. And what we realize is that so many entrepreneurs go after what we might call siloed solutions. So they're going, I have this one problem. I'm going to go find a specialist and fix this problem. And then it's like, have you ever seen the, the, um, the gopher game where you're like whacking, wha oh, whack-a-mole, where you whack-a-mole and then another one pops up? Another one all. pops up all the time, yeah. Yeah, and part of that is because, because nobody's, nobody's pulling back and thinking holistically, how do all these pieces work together? So I, you know, I might have, you know, a great product and I'm telling people, this is the best thing that's going to change the world and you're going to love buying this from us and we're going to support you. But I have a really sucky culture. And so when they actually call my company, they don't have a good experience. Well, how do we, how do we address the culture piece? Um, how do we address folks who don't understand their financials? It's amazing how many entrepreneurs are oh, scared to look at their books, right? They're like, I'll just give it to the tax guy. And all they're doing is wondering if they have cash in the bank, but they're not, they don't know what an income statement is or how to how to really pull levers and define like I'm actually profitable doing this thing. And this other thing that I'm spending all this time doing is not profitable. Maybe I should slow that thing up and really focus on this thing. So just some of those kinds of tweaks, like how do we think about this thing holistically? So that's the, the business model piece. And then the third part was leadership. Like we realized, okay, I, I admit that none of these things are super sexy and they're seemingly very obvious. I mean, there's probably people listening right now going, duh. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, but it was the no dumb moments that were getting neglected. It was the obvious things that just seemed to not, they were so obvious that it's like, I didn't even catch them. And growing as a leader is probably the most critical out of all of it. You've got to have the vision in place. You've got to have a business model in place that works. You've got to be working in a market that works and there's a niche and, and you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But 
But when you're working at your leadership, you've got to work on two different aspects of it, your inner game and your outer game. And your inner game is really your own personal development. It's your mindset. It's the working through issues you have. Are there things that trigger you and set you off or distract you? And, you know, some people are like, I just hit this one thing and I stop working because, or I avoid it like the plague because I hate it. And it's like, well, you got to get over. If you're, if you're anno- avoiding the finances, you got to figure out why and deal with some of those issues so that it's not so painful and you don't avoid it. Those are internal leadership issues. Those are mindset issues. Those are emotional issues that we've got to deal with. And sometimes those come from just the way we've been trained. We saw tractors instead of cows in the field. And what we need to see is learn how to see the, the cows in the field. And, or maybe it's a place where we just got hurt or wounded in life and we got to get healed. And all those things can affect. And it's just, we believe that it's a lifelong journey just to grow. You're not trying to fix it all in one month or one year, but you have to be intentional about working on that inner game. And then the outer game of leadership is really those tactical pieces that need to be accomplished in the business. How do you lead people? Whether you have employees, whether you have, they're in an office with you, whether they're diversified, or whether you are a solopreneur that actually has 15 or 20 uh, freelancers. And I, I submit to a lot of people in today's market, if you're a solopreneur with even three outsourced people, you've got a team. You, you may, legally, they may not be called employees, but you have people you have to communicate to. You have to focus on the goal of the company. You have to make sure that they stay on focus and they catch the big idea. You have to lead them. And so as you're growing, no matter what this modern shape of your business is, it all requires the ability for us as leaders to cast a vision, to have a model that we're looking at, and then to say, okay, I'm going to be a proactive, positive leader that encourages people and pulls people along. Because if we really want to accomplish a vision or a dream for us, something that is really beyond us, which I think we're all designed as human beings to dream beyond what we can do right now, and then pour our lives into it. And if you're going to do that, I hypothesize that you cannot do it alone. You must do it with others. You can go quickly alone, they say. But the old saying says to go far, you've got to go together. And I I think it's an old saying because it's true. It's true. I believe it. Go fast, go alone. Go far, go together. And so when you do these things, you bring those together. And for us, it was we've been working with clients so long and we wanted to do two things. One, we wanted to reach more people because we only have so much time. Mm-hmm. That's why it's one of the reasons we wrote the book. And the other one is, is a, a really, a, Catherine says it really well, but um, we wrote the book out of a sense of obedience also, mm-hmm. a sense that we had a responsibility to give away what we had been given and earned and, and so much advice and wisdom and everything else. And if we had something that would save somebody else pain, and give them more joy and help families be healthier and companies be healthier and more people have jobs that is something that we all need in our communities and we're like okay let's do it so we went down that incredibly daunting path uh, that took us about four years from the time we started it to actually landing with a book that we're proud of yeah we built a course before we had the book we did all these little pieces that so that the hobo village which is an acronym half a bubble out so the hobo village we built that course which helped give some definition and, and um parameters even for how we would write the book and that was really good but ultimately, you know, if you go back to the beginning of this question and the answer was 400%, what we realized in that season was that the company had grown beyond our leadership skills. Mm. So it had outgrown mm-hmm. our ability to lead it well. So ultimately, we had to pull back and go, this is about us and our leadership. And we have to fix this. Um, and, and, you know, for entrepreneurs, um, most entrepreneurs don't have a business degree. They didn't, they, you know, they didn't go through school and learn all this stuff. And, and I'm not even sure schools teach it well. So how did, where's, you know, where was the single, you know, a single resource that I could go to and actually have it describe a fully orbed company? Like, where was that for small businesses? And, and that's what we wrote was, you know, we really want you to succeed. And so here's a business model to help you think about gaining competency in each of the core areas of business, but doing it through a grid of what we would call passion and provision. Ultimately, you're, you're wanting to maintain relationships. You want to have a thriving business that provides for you, but also that you love working in and that people love supporting you and working with you in. So that's, that's what the book is about. Gotcha. 
And, and that's also one of the most important things, because if you don't love working in your business, then it's, it's going to feel like you are working for somebody else, right? Just like you hated the previous job, the nine to five. If you don't love the one that you own, well, in that case, maybe it should be just to let somebody else manage it if, if you don't love it. Or like you said, yeah. to change the culture and make it something that you like. Because I, I, know, I know how the, uh, the 400% works and how some of the mistakes come from the 400% growth because you yeah. grow too fast and you have to adapt. You have to do something. So then the wrong hiring is happening. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the half fast jobs happen because you have to get some stuff done. And, but there's also the other thing that a lot of people, like you said, number one is vision. Mm. But before you have that vision, not all, not everybody's let's say, how can I put this allowed to follow a vision because a lot of entrepreneurs start mm. and if they get that first client that they need desperately, and they know it is the wrong client mm. and they know maybe that it's well just it's just enough to know that it's, it's the wrong client and it's not fitting in their vision but they need them yes to survive financially yeah you know you have to you have to take it or are you, are you going to follow vision when you're starting out that strictly or will you would you take if you were starting out right now, would you take that? Oh, I'm so glad question. you asked that question. That's fantastic. No one's ever asked that question before. No, well that's done. a good one. I like it. Um, I, I, can I? Yes, please. Okay. Um, I love this question. I love what it's, it gives us the opportunity to talk about. And that is the fact that this, this whole idea of passion and provision and having this, this company that you love is a journey. And oftentimes, um, that moment you decide to start a company, there are things, if you're on your second or third company or you've never started a company now at all, there are things you can do to better plan your start that's going to give you a, a more of a head start down that road of enjoying it. Mm -hmm. We say that you should at least strive to get to the place where you like what you're doing 51% of the time or what the work you're doing is is rewarding at least 51% of the time because 100% of the time, that's just a pipe dream. It, I don't yeah, want to yeah. ever infer that like, the Redmonds have this model that will teach you how to be always happy, happy and never sad. All the time. And that's <laughs> never a struggle. That's, that's Walt it. Disney. Uh, yeah. yeah, right? Well, hey, wait, 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 wait. Don't insult Walt. I really appreciate it. I got my Walt Disney cup here right now. So, all right. But other commercial ventures out there besides Walt. Um, anyway, I'm just teasing. Uh, th that idea is you need, you do need to work. There's a sense of a work ethic and a plowing and and we didn't even talk about persistence today and, and, and having so grit, yeah. but that idea that if you have a clear vision and a, a business model and you're working as a leader, you're at least equipping yourself to head a trajectory in the right direction. And then we all, all, I don't know a business person yet ever who hasn't picked up clients that they didn't want because they needed a client mm -hmm. or took a customer's dollar bill because they, would, they didn't actually like that customer, but they were willing to sell them a widget because they came with money. And at some point you're like, okay, I have lines. I have, I have like, I will not work for a mass murderer. Okay, I just kind of, that's one of our lines that have to bubble out. Other people might be okay with that. Yeah, early on the guy wanted to hire us to help design pornographic t-shirts. I was like, yeah, no, <laughs> that's not, that's not my jam. <laughs> but I think to speak to those people who are, who are really struggling with what you're saying and saying, I am doing this and I'm not loving it, but I have to take this because we have to pay I quit my job and now we got to pay the mortgage and the kids need, you know, dental work and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I get it. And here's the deal. Do the, do the work to the best of your ability and serve those people. Well, it will sharpen your stick. It will increase your ability to do the potential. And then don't just stop there and say, I don't know how to do this. Work on this model. If nothing else, get our book. It's really inexpensive. You can get it for 10 bucks on our website. You don't even have to pay the full 20 bucks at Amazon. And, and just read and start learning about what you can do to prep yourself. Because if you put these things in place, you know, and you get into good, a good business model with all the good marketing and everything else, and we've got chapters of all of those they could start plugging in place, they'll move themselves farther and farther away from taking clients they don't want and closer to taking only clients they do want or having customers they want or having a market that they want. And we have two companies 
Well, uh, kind of three. We have the marketing and advertising and consulting. We have the online training and education. And then we started eight years ago a company in the pet food industry that serves, that sells hay to people who have pet rabbits, guinea pigs, and chinchillas. Because, you know, why not? Why not? We, we were bored. Why not? We um, needed an e-commerce experiment. And, and even in a product-based, manufacturing-based environment, you still get customers that you don't want. And they call and bug right. you. And, oh. and like... And, like, and, and if they're crazy rabbit owners, oh my gosh, they are crazy, not, crazy people. And not all rabbit owners are crazy because there might all. be some listening to your podcast. No. In which case they should order hay from Rabbit Hole Hay. But <laughs> in any business, product <laughs> or service, there are times when you have customers and you, if you move in that direction, we get it. We've done it. We even to this day, we still make mistakes and, and we, have, we still ever once in a while, although we do it a lot less frequently, Make the mistake and hire a client. Bring on a client. Hire a client. We call them hiring a client. Yes, yeah. And then we find out, oh, we didn't. That was that wasn't a good idea. It looked like a good idea. We did all our due diligence, but uh, that didn't look like a good idea. And we just have to say this is not a good fit and move on. Um, but there's times when you're like, you know, it's a recession. There's not as many clients out there. I can't just really do I it can't easily. Be picky. We're gonna we're gonna stick it out. And and I think that the true the true measure of any individual is shown in adversity. And if you can, if you can shine and rise above in the middle of that adversity and then have a plan to pull you out of the adversity, um, you're going to win in the end. Is that, is, how do you think? Is that, was that a good answer? That, that was an awesome answer. Okay. And uh, you know what? During my research, I did find the rabbit hole. Hey, so I oh, look, yeah. yeah, I checked your Shopify site. I, I, I like it. I learned that hay has to be grown preferably a couple thousand feet above sea level, and that's where you get that premium hay. And uh, you really what, did, you didn't did. <laughs> Yes. Um, well, e commerce is my thing. So when I saw your Shopify site, I got excited and I was looking into it. And uh, well, how do you but, think we're doing? Give us a grade. Uh, on on the site, on the site looks, you mean? Yeah. Uh, I don't give anybody a 10, right? So not even Elon Musk with his Tesla site, they don't get a 10. But uh, I would say that's a nine. It's really nice. it's very appealing. And at least I I wasn't even, I didn't even have intent to buy anything because I don't grab rabbits, but I did spend a good 20 minutes looking at it. So it's, no, yeah, my, kid, my kids need a rabbit. Yeah, I should buy a rabbit for my children. By the way, we ship internationally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so where, where else do you sell? Just on your Shopify site? Are you on Walmart, uh, Amazon? Chewy, Chewy.com, Amazon. Amazon. Walmart. We are on Walmart. Yeah. But but I'll tell you what, that's not a fun it's experiment. Horrible. We're going to eject ourselves from that. Talking about having a bad customer. Oh, Walmart's, Walmart's not a great a customer. customer. Yeah, yeah. And then we ship to nine international countries. So we're shipping to Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, Philippines. We're in a lot yeah. of different countries. Wow. Yeah. 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 So. And we got discovered on uh, by several of the distributors on Amazon and our website. They found us yeah. and then came and said, hey, we need your product here. <laughs> hey, we need your product. <laughs> nice. Uh <-huh>. Yes. <laughs> so, um, I, I mean, before we change subject, what makes premium hay compared to normal hay? Yeah. So, I mean, really, so there's rabbits, guinea pigs, chinchillas. What they need early in life is Timothy hay. And what makes it premium for us is that a lot of a lot of the stuff that you would just go buy on the shelf, they're not they're not quality controlling their sources, and so you're going to get brown and yucky and all that kind of stuff. A lot whereas, of dust in the a lot bags. of dust. Just yeah. Where, whereas for us, we're we're working closely with the farmers, and we're making sure that that the hay is is really good and green, and then we hand pack it, so it's going to be those long strings instead of just a bunch of dust. So, so. The, all these things come from just kind of a it looks nicer. It's not chopped up into small pieces. It has less dust and it's more nutritious in, in many ways. And so yeah. there's your and, premium. And it is grown a couple thousand feet above sea level. Yeah. yeah it has to be yeah. grown in a rain shadow actually yeah. at that elevation. It has to be like the perfect crop is grown where it's warm enough, but not too hot. And it has just enough water, but not too much. So there's places along the Pacific West coast of the United States where it's got that 1,000 to 2,000 elevation, and most of the valleys where it's grown is in a rain shadow. So there's a mountainside between that valley and the ocean that stops a lot of the rain, but not all of it. Yeah. Huh. It's, so, so it's, it's not passive. It's not passive at all. There's work to be done. 
a lot of work to do. And we fa- and we literally stumbled across the entire concept before 2012. We didn't know it existed, and then we found it, which is a whole other spiel we talk about when we talk about super niches mm-hmm. um, because of that. <laughs> awesome. So well, time's running out, but before I let you go, um, I know you guys also have a podcast. What's it called? Hobo Village, and it's on uh, Apple Podcast. So Hobo Village Podcast with Michael and Catherine Redman. And then we have hobovillage.com, which is our website. And then our book is on fulfilledthebook.com, fulfilledthebook.com. And that's where you can get the book. Anybody who's listening, you can get the book for 10 bucks. And it's a great deal. And we just, uh, an opportunity to say, hey, here you go. Thank you. And there's a few bonuses that are thrown in on that too. And there's also, um, within the book, there's resources. And so you can actually, if you have the book, you can... um, Go to our website, download the resources. And worksheets and all kinds of stuff to help you walk of, through yeah. the different so things. So really practical, tangible. Yeah. So. It, it's been labeled by others as a mini MBA for businesses with a common real world experience. Yeah. Nice. That's what you need. The real world experience. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Michael and Catherine. I appreciate you guys being here. For you guys that are listening, I'm going to have all their links on the show notes so you can find out more about them and you can check out rabbit hole hey you can check the <laughs> fulfill the book and uh basically if you can connect with uh, michael and Catherine, pleasure having you guys here uh, i mean we have to do this again because there's so much to talk about well, we, <laughs> we would, would love, love to, to do a take too very fun <laughs> awesome thank you thank you